Okay, so shifting gears back to the original kind of idea here. So what we're trying to do as plant managers is to maximize the capture of sunlight with plants. So that's like across growing spaces. So maximizing it across your fields, across your garden area, whatever it is, and over time throughout the season. So taking advantage of any bare ground that you might have at any point in time. And we think of this as a way to, to effectively like widen that bottleneck of sunlight being pumped underground to communicate with microbes, enabling more access to soil nutrients. Basically, the more bare ground you have, the tighter the bottleneck. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so, uh, in, in a way, you can think of bare ground as just a lost opportunity. Um, it's one that weeds will surely fill in, of course, but if, you're, if you happen to love weeding and leaving that, that ground bare between your plants, then that, that is a real lost opportunity. Um, and so throughout this talk, we're going to advocate for ways that you can kind of plug in, um, try to minimize the bare ground thing without sacrificing too much yield, and maybe provide a lot of other services to your plants, to beneficial insects, so on and so forth. Basically, you know, there's a, 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 a brilliant and dynamically interactive living architecture of plants um, that occurs in nature, and we can best capture that when we're doing cover crops by doing multi-species cover crops, we can best capture that when we're growing plants, uh, we're growing crops by including cover crops in the areas that normally would be bare, and all of those plants are delivering energy to the soil through soil exudates. And so the more diversity of plants, the more diversity of architecture, the more sunlight being captured. You know, and if you just look at a multi-species cover crop in a, in a field, you'll just notice that, how there's just virtually no light that makes it to the ground, which is exactly, exactly what you want. And meanwhile, these plants are also, of course, protecting the ground from hard pounding rains and baking sun. And so maximizing that incredibly brilliant dynamic um, interaction of all these soil types and leaf types, or rather leaf types, can really enhance your fertility. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in order to make this happen, I think that you can kind of break this into three just sort of general categories. So you can work cover crops into your uh, rotation or into your management by overseeding or interseeding cover crops into a growing crop. The idea being that you're trying to like minimize the time frame in which you like get one crop out of the ground and you're establishing a cover crop. You kind of try to make that happen at the same time in the same place. And there, there might be an opportunity for some cover crops to double as a cash crop. Category two would be to basically be planting different cash crops at the same, in the same space in the same time, uh, for which there's like many, many options and methods to get there. And then finally, to maybe, maybe use weeds when all else fails or when it pays to use weeds, depending on the weed, of course, because things can get hairy and out of control very quickly, but don't always think about weeds as an inherent problem and maybe they can be a patch over the ground when you don't have the time to deal with a, a weed problem, so long as you don't let them go to seed, of course. Um, and some weeds are plenty nutritious, can fetch a little price at the market, and certainly should be thought of in the kitchen garden as good guys a lot of the time. Actually, Mark, I would say probably most of the weeds that you find in your garden that are performing this function we're describing are actually more nutritious than your crops by a significant factor. Some of the deepest nutrition you have is those weeds. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, and we'll cover a couple of examples of those. Okay, and so then finally, for like the kind of guiding concept of the maximizing solar fertility idea is to find complementarity in the crops, cash crops or cover crops that you're growing. So ones that have complementary, let's say, growth habit or architecture so that you've got like a, a broadleaf crop that's low to the ground and it's um, sitting underneath a taller, finer leafed crop where like sunlight can still get through to it and the, the height difference and the difference in the leaf shape al allows that to happen. And similarly, there might be complementarity or just like a, a complementary preference for sun versus shade. We'll show an example of that. Um, and then definitely, and I think maybe this is where most of the action is happening, is the transition from warm to cool season or vice versa, when you can kind of relay crops, cash crops together. And then just taking advantage of the timing at which you seed or transplant or whatever it is to get things in the ground to ensure that uh, you know, the, the one that you want to live gets uh, you know, a competitive advantage over the other and does better, gets 
close to the yield that you want, but still you have this other crop going on that you can also manage in a way to, um, to meet or suit your end. And I'd say that the other piece that you can play with here is the growth rate of some plants. So you can put something like purslane in, you know, sow purslane after your corn is maybe a foot tall or something. There'll be no competition at all, and yet it is going to grow fast enough that it's going to be able to capture enough sunlight that it's going to be well established by the time it starts to get canopied by the corn. And you'll, you could get several harvests from that purslane prior to um, the corn actually getting to a point where there's not much else going to be growing. And a, a wonderful book that's out of print, but you can find it, and I think it might be one of those ones that Google has in its vast collection. It's called Weeds, Guardians of the Soil. Um, and it actually literally uses the purslane example, that seeing that happen in a field that this young, as a young person, he weeded for a farmer and the farmer came out at lunchtime and said, leave the purslane in, it's good for the corn, came back that summer, late in the summer after a severe drought and the half of the field that he had weeded the purslane out was shriveled up and the half that had the purslane still in there, now gone to seed, was actually green and thriving. So it's a great example of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a delicious one to eat too. Okay, this is actually, I first, I first experienced this serendipitously. We had planted, I think, beets into a bed, and there was a bunch of volunteer buckwheat that came up. And the buckwheat would have eventually been a problem and competed with the beets, but we had an ace up our sleeve, and that was, you see the row cover there on the right of the slides? Um, that row cover was placed there because this was growing basically in probably mid-November. It was in a greenhouse, but that greenhouse wasn't heated and was still gonna freeze. And so we could allow the buckwheat to keep growing, suppressing the normal winter weeds, which we would have had plenty of, like chickweed and henbit. If you ever tried to weed those out of a beet crop or something, you know it's a lot of work, right? But they don't grow as fast as the buckwheat. The buckwheat had enough warmth because it was in a greenhouse, was smothering those. The, cover, the, the crop, which was Elegant's um, braising mix, was doing fine with the buckwheat, but was gonna be disadvantaged pretty soon. We got to choose on a cold night in November when to terminate the buckwheat. We kept it, we pulled the cover crop over the buckwheat and the elegance mix for all the nights that we wanted the buckwheat to be there. And then when we finally said, well, the buckwheat's getting too rambunctious, we left, left the cover crop off. The buckwheat all froze and the elegance mix was released. And actually just now I was thinking that is a little bit dicey maybe for some people because you could actually you know, not get it right. Or what if you didn't get a frost? What if we had a year like 2011 where it never really got very cold at all and the buckwheat wouldn't die in the greenhouse? Then you might have a problem with it. So you might substitute instead broadleaf cress, which is gonna grow equally fast and you could harvest it to control it. But you, what you want is something else in your mix that's growing really fast, faster than those weeds. And so that's the concept here. And we a couple times have successfully used the, the fact that we would get a frost to use buckwheat for this and it's worked pretty well. And it's just, just an idea. I wouldn't say that we've got this figured out and I guarantee you that it'll be a while before anybody's certain of how that's gonna work, but it's a possibility. This was an example of me using a, a system which was developed a year before, which we'll see a slide of later on, which is that we're constantly like trying to control weeds and we're busy and we have access where we are to leaves. We get leaves delivered to us by neighbors. I love that one neighbor who used to burn leaves all through the fall and fill our neighbor with its smoke, smoke, found out that he could deliver to us instead. And so he brings us, you know, yards and yards of leaves. He has a little lawnmower with a cart on the back and he brings us those leaves. So we mulch a lot, and we mulch this crop of cauliflower, but I'd learned a, about a year or two before that you can actually sow cover crop seeds on top of the leaves, because we, we would tend not to do this kind of cover crop planting because we wouldn't want to take the time to pull the leaves off again. But I thought about it, and as long as you have moisture, which we have plenty of here in Mills River, um, or you can apply moisture, those cover crops are going to be germinating on top of that mulch and they can grow down through the mulch. And they do indeed, and they thrive. And so I took what I learned from that, and we'll talk more about that a little later, and applied it to planting pea shoots. Pea shoots are one of my ideal intercrops because you get paid to do it. 
It, it's like buckwheat, yeah, sure, it can exclude weeds, but you have to work to get rid of it, and you're not getting paid to do that. With the pea shoots, I actually got three cuttings from these pea shoots, and they, they weren't really suppressing weeds at that point because the leaves were taking care of that, but what they were doing was pumping those exudates down, capturing that carbon, you know, capturing the, the power of the sunlight and putting that carbon into the soil. And at the same time, giving me a cash crop. The one thing you want to know about that is you're going to rot that mulch away faster by having those leaves on top of that. For us, that's no problem. You know, if you wanted that, let's say you were doing garlic, you might not want to do that in garlic because you might want that mulch to last you through the harvest. So garlic, we might have a different strategy. But for a brassica like this, cauliflower, which is going to be done by the first deep hard frost, then that's fine. You know, you've just basically prepared your bed. This slide is actually a favorite of mine because it was, it was sent to me by John Rowland, who has our farm. He heard I was doing a no-till talk, and he described a situation where he decided to take advantage of solar energy to get himself another crop. He had planted largely radishes, forage radishes or oilseed radishes in this area. Radishes are great because they're accumulators. So in a lot of our fields, we have excess nitrogen and other nutrients left at the end of the season. If you leave the soil bare, a lot of that's going to leach away. So we all know to plant cover crops. He planted radishes. Radishes almost always, if we have any kind of deep cold, are pretty damaged by late winter and aren't really going to go anywhere. They're going to kind of rot away. Um, and he knew that was happening. He could see they were damaged. So he sowed spinach into them. And the spinach didn't do much for a while because, it, because of a lack of rain, but they were... It was kind of nursed. Those little plants were nursed by these dying radishes. Then the rains came. The radishes, you can't even see them anymore. They disappeared, but in their disappearance, they released that accumulated nitrogen and other nutrients, and he got a bumper crop of spinach, hundreds of dollars worth of spinach, just for scattering spinach seeds into his radish crop. So that's a way that he took advantage of that solar energy um, while at the same time gathering a, a, a cash crop. Yeah. And I think when you and I talked about this, we noted that the, in the picture, it's a, a little bit bare in places and that maybe he could have plugged in your... That's where peas, the pea shoots, pea pea shoots would yeah. have been the perfect fit into yeah. there. You yeah. know, they would, they would have taken up that space. There wasn't a problem of weeds because the residue from the radishes, you can see, are kind of suppressing the weeds. But once again, the right day, you know, and you're not going to plant pea shoots out there, you know, when you've got a hot, dry week. You're going to pick a rainy week to put them out there because they're on top of the soil. You're not incorporating them. But it works, you can make it work pretty well. We, here, at least here in, in Western North Carolina, we have plenty of weeks where those pea shoots are ger gonna germinate and get their roots down through that plant residue. And then this is a, an experiment I did the same time that I played with, the, for the first time, planting cover crops into a heavy mulch. And basically, we had a bed of beets. They were, they've already taken some damage from coal. They're about three to four weeks out from harvest. Um, and on the left, you can see right, right after the first harvest that shows the beets densely planted really close together and just a few little green shoots popping up. That was the seed of the multi-species cover crop that I seeded into those beets four weeks before we harvested them, roughly. Could it be three and a half, four weeks or something. Those cover crop seedlings were going to go nowhere as long as the beets were there. And you might wonder, I wondered, is it going to be worth doing this? Because what about the damage I'm going to do to those um, cover crop seedlings when we harvest the beets. I figured I'd just try it, and you can see the result in the middle, middle part of that slide because that's what was left after we harvest the beets. You can see at the very far end, there's still some beets that haven't been harvested. I actually wondered when I sowed this, did I sow enough? And I looked at this and thought, I need to come back and put more seed on, but I didn't. And I love that I didn't because the result was the final part of this slide on the right. And that's what happened from that one sowing of beets where actually if we waited to harvest, we probably wouldn't have bothered to sow a cover crop because it wouldn't have been worth the expense of seeds for how long we'd be able to leave it in before we planted our tomatoes. But in this situation, we picked up four more weeks of cover crop time by sowing into the beets. And i let you cover it, Mark. This slide we realize is the moment to talk about how to make this cost effective because we're talking about using a lot of seed here and you all know if you've been buying cover crop seed, it's not free. And so do you want to speak to density of planting? Yeah, sure. I think it, it just raises the point of, especially when you're hand broadcasting, it's like really easy to be heavy handed 
with broadcasting seed. And then you end up with like, you know, one, one row or one bed that costs you a hundred bucks to cover crop seed. So in, in this case where you're interseeding, it's particularly important to go light on seeding to like pay better attention to how much you're putting out because maybe importantly, you're just trying to get a little bit of cover going while you still have a crop in there and you don't want it to compete. And so to avoid competition, be more careful about that heavy handed cover crop sowing thing. And it ends up fine usually, which is maybe itself and a lesson in like how not to go heavy handed in broadcasting seed anyway. Um, but it's more important in this case because you, you are at risk of putting your, uh, your cash crop at um, you know, a disadvantage by throwing out too much. And I would say that this was definitely revelatory for me. I looked at that, that second middle part of the, of the bed there and thought, I didn't sow heavy enough. I need to come back and sow. But because, frankly, I was fortunate to have too much going on and I didn't do it, I got the lesson of seeing what it produced. And it's helped me to actually back off on my seeding usually. Well, I still get a little carried away sometimes. We all and want success. Was this in going into winter or was this coming this out? This was coming out of winter. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe to kind of like flip this around a little bit, it's worth just mentioning as like a general cover cropping practice. If, if this was going into winter, the closer you get to like plants shutting down for winter, you should be a little bit more heavy handed with your cover crop sowing because the, in warm weather, these cool season grasses and stuff that you're putting out, they, they tiller, they grow more shoots and they can cover more ground. But the closer you get to uh, things shutting down for winter, the less they're gonna do that. And so it helps to have better coverage by just throwing out a little bit more. So just a word to the wise on that one. 